So hi everyone and welcome to this webinar regarding TLS experiences implementing robotics for agent assistance. So today it's going to be me, Fredrik Lemming, Sales Director at Telia, uh, together with my colleague Matthias Johansson, Head of Automation and AI. He will join this webinar a bit later into the uh, presentation that we conduct this uh, webinar. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we are going to talk about uh, uh, Telia in brief, just to give you a backdrop to what Telia is all about, but then we're going to focus on robotics. What is what? Reality versus myth. What are we doing at Telia? Some ca cases and also have uh, to round up with some lessons learned and key takeaways and also look into the future a bit. So Telia, we are a telco in the Nordic and the Baltics, uh, pretty much equivalent to uh, Deutsche Telekom, uh, headquartered in Stockholm, roughly 20,000 employees, a wholesale telco with a B2C and a B2B division. We're also a global player with our carrier business, and as such, 35% uh, of uh, the world's internet traffic is channeled through our backbones. Uh, Matthias and I, we are working within the B2B business, within the field of uh, contact center, uh, and having a portfolio for customer service operations. And one of the components and uh, the biggest offering that we are having, it's called TLAs. And here you can see some statistics about uh, or KPIs about TLAs. It's one out of eight uh, uh, contact center as a service platforms that made it into the Gartner Medic Audit this year. But this is just a piece of the puzzle in order to assist our customers in the Nordic Baltics and Northern Europe with uh, customer service capabilities. Uh, so we're not just supplying the traditional call contact center functionality, uh, we are also supplying other features and functions. And one of them are, of course, robotics that we are going to talk about today. And we're going to share with you our experiences from being a supplier, but also being the uh, leading customer service operation in the Nordics. So what we are going to share with you today is uh, the best from the best of two worlds. Uh, so it's going to be from us as a supplier, but also us as a big uh, customer service operation and a process intensive uh, company. To start off, uh, we're going to talk about how, to, uh, how to you could automate different uh, 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 features and functions and processes within an operation. And then you need to understand uh, what are we talking about. And you can go from simple to complex uh, processes, uh, automation, and you could also go from rule-based to cognitive, or you could divide them into these different topics or items, structured, unstructured, and semi-structured. And what is the characteristics of different sort of structured types of uh, uh, operations? Well, in order to design this, uh, it's not just about data. I'm going to show you um, an example of um, uh, of this with a, a book metaphor. Uh, it's also about processes. Uh, how processes, are they static? Uh, are they, e, uh, do they require anyone to take decisions, to interpret and to understand what is being said? Or uh, it has also to do with the environment. Is the environment static? Uh, often it con consists of many different subsystems, but are they static or do they interact with each other depending on different sort of input and outputs? And all of this uh, boils down to the requirements, if it's structured or if it's unstructured. And of course, if there's a mix, then it's going to be semi-structured. And the normal way of uh, trying to leverage uh, with technology on different challenges in different processes, I will come back to. But let's look at this from a, a, a data perspective and take this book as an example. Uh, in this example, you could have a, a traditional phone book or something, which is very much sort of rule-based. Uh, it's easy to navigate within, and you could have uh, rule-based algorithms to find things, look up things. It follows a specific pattern, a typical sort of static uh, data. And obviously, I think you are familiar with this. Well, taking uh, the alternative uh, uh, metaphor when it comes to books is a novel, which is more unstructured. Here you have uh, requirements to understand language. You also need to understand context. You need to be able to interpret and to take decisions in order to understand what this is all about. And in order to manage and carve out details and findings from these uh, books or these processes or uh, workflows, 
you need to apply different technologies. And traditionally, uh, we are uh, implementing uh, what is uh, called RPA or uh, unattended automation for structured sort of processes and AI for unstructured. And then, of course, you have something in between, the bridge between those processes, because the reality is there is not just uh, either structured or unstructured processes in a company. There is a majority of the processes that are semi-structured. And what we are approaching the market with is uh, uh, a terminology or uh, capabilities that we are calling robots, which is the traditional unattended automation. and uh, uh, cobots, which is attended automation, and then of course we have AI, and they need to coexist. Uh, here, when you are finding processes and workflows uh, that uh, can combine these uh, dimensions, then really you can take productivity to the next level. So this is illustrated with this uh, volume gauger, where you can see that depending on your operation, you are more inclined maybe to be in need of cobots. Uh, rather than robots or the vice versa but it's very important to say there is uh, no operation that is uh, just robots just cobots they need to coexist and we're going to show you some examples later on when uh, we can see how they can coexist uh, we will not dive into the details more but keep in mind that uh, this is an illustration that uh, there is a predominance of different sort of processes Processes that requires either a cobot or a robot or a combination with AI, of course. So hopefully now you've understood that robots can boost productivity and what kind of uh, uh, different uh, activities can be automated using robot initiatives. Well, you could say that automating any desktop activity like a human, well, here you have the potential to use either robots or cobots. It could be mouse selection, field entry, copy pasting, screen navigation, log in and log out. And depending uh, of, uh, of uh, the previous uh, uh, dimension that I discussed about data, about uh, processes and environment, you would require a robot or a cobot or a combination, naturally. They will both work with and together with sort of all the business systems. Uh, and uh, I will already now say that it's not about sort of integrating systems with each other. So moving on to the next uh, uh, section, and now Matthias shortly will join this presentation. We are going to do a bit of myth busting here uh, as the popular uh, American TV show. It's going to be robot versus cobot. And I'm gonna post some statements and Matthias is going to uh, tell us if it's a myth or if it's reality and also give us a, a short sort of elaboration about sort of uh, the, his uh, comment. So the first statement, uh, attended automation involves a person looking after a robot, attending to it and waiting for it to do something. Press a button, have a cup of coffee and watch it while it works. And now over to you, Matthias, and, and welcome to this webinar. Thank you. Um, well, um, uh, we there are indeed cases uh, where attended automation is being treated this way. Um, but in reality, that is not attended automation. So I would say that uh, this is a myth. Uh, attended automation is more about having a, a robot uh, working in real time alongside a human being. Um, this is why we call them collaborating robots or cobots in short. Uh, a better way of viewing a cobot is, is as a, uh, some sort of a digital assistant um, that is reacting to what is happening in real time on the, let's say, contact center agent's desktop. Uh, it can be triggered in different ways, uh, either by the agent pressing a specific button to start a specific cobot process. Uh, it can be triggered by other events, such as specific data entries into specific fields in a specific application, for instance. Uh, or even uh, by something that the customer is actually speaking uh, in, a, in, in the call or, or typing in the chat. And I will mention a little bit more about that as we approach the end of this presentation. So this is, in fact, a better way of viewing intended automation or cobots, as we, as we like to call them. 
Okay, thank you. So uh, let's look at the next statement. Attended automation is about having a robot run on the desktop rather than a server. The robot automates the same tasks as it would on a server, but just on a PC. Uh, again, this, this is a myth. Um, you can obviously automate uh, processes uh, on a desktop, uh, as you would having them running on a virtual server some, some, somewhere in, in a basement. Um, but uh, attended automation is more about augmentation to human capabilities or human skills. Uh, it's not only about process automation. Uh, it's equally important to implement uh, the capability of doing real-time guidance, uh, supporting the agent with best practices on how to resolve specific tasks or, or, or issues that the customer may have, for instance. Uh, you can also use it to ensure or enforce compliance. Uh, you, can, uh, you, can, uh, you can help the agent in different easy or more difficult situations by, by guiding them. Uh, and especially if we talk about um, unexperienced, uh, unexperienced uh, personnel coming in and working, they can have this as an important and very powerful tool to help them get things right from, from day one, basically. And obviously, there is some automation too. Hmm. Okay, let's go for the next statement. What about this one? Uh, attended automation requires a different set of capabilities compared to unattended due to complex real-time environment. Uh, this is in fact uh, true. It's not a myth. Um, attended automation, uh, as it is working in a very dynamic environment, being the desktop's, uh, uh, the agent's desktop, uh, it needs, uh, it puts high requirements on how these uh, robots uh, connect to the business system that the agent normally works in. Um, a, an agent desktop may or, or may not be a static environment or, or, or a unified environment. Uh, there may be applications uh, open in different points in time, depending on what type of errand you're actually currently serving. These applications may be to the left or to the right, they may be enlarged or minimized, maybe even um, not visible for, for the human view. This means that if we talk about unattended automation, um, you, can, you can go pretty far with uh, doing uh, uh, screen, screen scraping type of automation. I'm not saying that this is the only thing you need for attended automation at all, uh, but you can do a lot with that. In uh, an attended setting uh, where the desktop changes uh, may look the, the differently from, from agent to agent, you need to connect to objects and items in the business system where the, the uh, cobot needs to work in a deeper fashion. And to be very clear here, we're not talking about doing traditional systems integration. We're still automating through the same business application. So it's still user interface automation but the way we interact with the objects in the applications are, are different. And this is because we need to have a much more robust connectivity uh, in, in this sort of live or dynamic environment. And we're gonna look at some cases where we can see the time it took to develop uh, and, and support these processes with Cobots and, and, and also RPA. Uh, yeah, we'll get back uh, to a, a couple of cases uh, covering both robots and Cobots in a few minutes. Okay, so we have busted some myths and uh, uh, really sort of underlined some realities and some statements. So what about, uh, what are we doing at uh, Telia? At Telia, uh, we are, we have been working with uh, robotic automation for, for, uh, for, for quite some years now. We actually started the first projects already back in 2015, but it sort of really started in, in I would say, um, uh, two, two years, two to three years ago, when we uh, made this uh, more broadly across the board, across the different types of organizations. And we, as many other companies, started doing automation in, in the shared services uh, um, parts of our company, uh, finance and HR, for instance. Um, 
and uh, as of as of late we have started deploying uh, also attended automation in a, in in our uh, uh, service desks and uh, contact center operations. So we're working quite broadly across the board with both attended and unattended automation. Uh, and uh, yeah. Um, so to give you a few a few examples of what we're doing, let me start with a very traditional uh, unattended uh, RPA case. Um, when we uh, sometimes we send out uh, incorrect invoices um, and it's a hassle for us to correct them. When they return or when the customer calls us and says there's something wrong, uh, it's, it's quite a tedious process for us to get this right. We're handling about uh, 27,000 transactions of this type per month and it takes roughly 10 minutes per, per, per transaction to handle manually. So, uh, and this is quite a straightforward process. Uh, it took us about 10 days to analyze this, uh, this process, how it was done manually, and about 30 days to automate it. Um, and this uh, has helped us save, uh, if we convert the, the hours here, uh, the 27,000 times 10 minutes, if we convert that to some sort of uh, monetary saving, it equals roughly 1 million euro annually. So this is a pretty straightforward, classic uh, robotic automation case. Uh, the next case is, is somewhat different. Uh, it's still robot or unattended automation, but it's used in a, in a quite interesting way. Um, in in Telia, Norway, we had some problems uh, with fraud when people were ordering terminals uh, in our online uh, web shop. Um, unfortunately, the authentication um, uh, process that we were employing at, that, at the time were not sufficient um, and it cost us quite a lot of money. Uh, so we used then a robot to detect um, patterns that indicated fraud, fraudulent behavior. And that robot could actually stop those purchases going through uh, at the source uh, while they were happening. Uh, and this uh, meant that we could we could have a a two million euro annual saving in terms of reduced fraud costs. So this is somewhat a bit different use case for a, a robotic automation. But what is even more interesting is that this was sort of a bridge solution because we knew that the, we were waiting for a a thorough uh, overlook of the uh, online uh, terminal uh, sort of uh, sorry not terminal the the the, the web shop. Uh, with uh, proper authentication, um, and at, when we had that, this robot was decommissioned, uh, and fraud obviously were minimized by proper authentication and proper checking of the actual online purchase. So this is basically a robot that lived for a while, and then we terminated it. And while doing so, it could save us some uh, two million euros. So you can use these guys for different purposes uh, to bridge gaps uh, when you're in, in sort of some transformation projects, uh, etc. And I'm sure mo many of you already know about these opportunities. So if we go into cobots, um, I'm going to show you a short movie of uh, what a process may look like when we automate it using a cobot. Uh, so this is this is an agent desktop, or actually it's it's not showing everything. It's just showing the 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 business application that the agent works with when the customer calls in and says, "I want to terminate my subscription." Uh, so that's the big window you see in the background. The small blue window to the left is basically the interface where the agent communicates with the cobot. So in this interface, uh, this interface may look differently depending on what type of uh, issue you're currently handling. Uh, this interface can also be used to, um, to uh, show uh, a customer profile or a customer history or some other information that may be accurate or uh, necessary for handling the case at hand. Uh, but in this case, this communication window uh, asks the agent for some input. Uh, and this is in Swedish, so obviously we cannot understand probably what, what's says there, but the cobot will ask the agent, um, 
uh, what is the reason for the cancellation and what product, basically. So the agent will receive the call, speak to the customer and collect that customer's social security number. And you will see a lot of uh, um, purple bar, uh, things uh, popping up here in, in this video because we're hiding some, some uh, personal information from, from, from you. So the, the call enters, the agent enters the um, uh, social security number in the business system and the cobot picks that up, fills in, says this is the customer, uh, the agent then fills in cause for uh, cancellation, what product, and then clicks a button to say perform the cancellation. So everything that is happening now is being done by the uh, cobot. Um, while this is happening, the agent can do other things. The agent can uh, continue speaking with the customer. Uh, it can take wrap-up notes, for instance, or it can, you know, start serving another customer in a chat, for instance. Now the the robot has or the cobot has uh, stopped working and the case is closed. Um, this, what you saw now, can also be done in hidden view. Obviously, it, it can be minimized, but it wouldn't be much of a video if you didn't see what was happening. So this is one way to work with a cobot to actually automate a process. Um, this is something that saves us uh, roughly 7,000 hours uh, uh, per year um, uh, because the time savings for doing this with the cobot on the desktop is huge. Another thing that I would like to point out here is that we have in fact optimized this uh, even further because when we reach a point where it's not necessary to actually report something back to the agent or the customer in real time. Uh, you know, it's just about completing the, the last bits of the process. We might as well send that over to an unattended robot working somewhere in the background on a, on a server uh, somewhere. So that will free up even more time. Um, another thing, we did a similar thing with cobots in our service ticket management handling for our uh, enterprise support uh, ent uh, entrances. Re registering service tickets, uh, about 20,000 uh, service tickets per month, uh, three minutes handling time per case. Uh, the same basically principle as in the movie that you saw uh, uh, recently. Uh, but this time where the savings are even larger, we're, it's, we're talking 12,000 hours their productivity improvements. Uh, so working across the board with both attended and unattended automation has really helped us leverage the, the opportunities or, or take advantage of the opportunities that robotic automation gives us by, by moving this type of technology all the way out to the front, of, front and back office. Um, yeah. So how do, how do you collect ideas for automation? This obviously applies for both attended and unattended automation. <clears throat> Normally you can go through a process of, of, uh, of uh, mapping out different processes and uh, finding out what's happening and uh, what processes are the most important and uh, which takes more time, et cetera, et cetera. But the number one reason why automation projects fail is because we choose the wrong processes to automate. Often we choose the, the a too, too complex process as the first process because we, we believe this is the most important process that we have and we fail. So we need to start small and create knowledge and experience before we scale this up. Um, so some important things to ask yourself uh, is, yes, we probably know what kind of processes we have and which are important and, and which happen often, but do we know details about how long our employees spend in different types of applications? And what is the most efficient way to actually perform a process? Um, which team or, or employee does this in the most efficient way, et cetera, et cetera. So this you can actually measure automatically. Uh, one way of doing this is to use something we call an automation finder. This is a piece of software that works by machine learning to identify patterns that may signal that this is actually a process happening. So what we do is basically we install a piece of software, uh, we, we select a team of uh, workers that are working on basically the same type of, let's say, skills in, in the contact center or the same type of tasks in, let's say, the finance department. We install this client, a specific client on their desktop and let it run there for a few weeks. 
and then by using machine learning we can start identifying which patterns actually signal that something regularly is happening we do not feed this application with any input data uh, we're not telling it look for this or that or look for this specific process we're not bootstrapping it it's sort of learning by itself this can then tell us uh, it can give us a few candidates and say hey i've found something i think is a process and in doing so it also gives us some metrics whether this is a process that takes uh, a long time to complete or a short time to complete whether it's simple or complex in terms of maybe how many different types of business applications you're working in and what type of data you're you're shipping uh, between these applications whether it's ha happening often or or rarely um, whether the process is important obviously and no machine can tell us <clears throat> that is something that we can we can say whether you know this is a business critical process or not or we can by 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 looking at a process that is happening regularly obviously it's probably significant and not a, a trivial uh, process for our operations and also about var variance you know is, is this seasonal does it happen only on mondays or only on uh, mondays the first uh, every month or just during the summer holidays or something like this or is it an even distribution and this is a very efficient way to help us find the correct processes to actually automate and also to, to create the business cases for automating those processes. <clears throat> so um, if we look a bit ahead uh, of what, what, we, what we are working on and, and uh, also what we see is happening, sort of the, the trends on the market, um, just uh, two uh, examples uh, that, that we feel are strategically, strategically important both for, for us as a, a company but also for us as a, a contact center uh, technology vendor and provider. So we've seen how we can use cobots to uh, provide agent assistance uh, by uh, real-time guidance, next best action, by process automation. And, and uh, we can obviously add AI to this in different ways. We can add AI capabilities by uh, let's say intelligent character recognition, uh, meaning that we can have a an attended or unattended robot searching through unstructured data and trying to make sense of this to to use that as as input to to a process or a during a process. But there are other ways also to enhance these uh, by by adding some AI capabilities in terms of uh, language and speech recognition, for instance. So um, this is a very normal way of starting a customer service journey today a customer calls in or chats in and starts uh, talking to a some sort of virtual assistant it could be a chatbot on your web page or a conversational ivr solution or, or something like that this virtual assistant obviously has some sort of knowledge base that it connects to containing uh, structured or unstructured data but that is not the, what i'm going to talk about uh, in this session at some point, uh, the virtual assistant may want to transfer the customer to the agent. So very classical uh, uh, use case today. And this agent, it's very important, obviously, that this agent has access to the same type of knowledge that the virtual assistant has. And uh, if it does, uh, we, can, we can allow the virtual assistant to stay on the call or the chat. And I was thrilled to see that the webinar after this is actually seems to be talking about how chatbots and agent can work in in, in 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 conjunction with each other um, but anyway having a virtual assistant listening in on the call uh, trying to understand and detect the customer's intent and trying to pick out uh, necessary or important information such as social security number uh, we can enhance the agent assistance capabilities so for instance the the movie that i just showed you uh, a virtual assistant can actually be this agent assistant function can actually be the one that starts the cobot process because it identifies that the customer says i want to cancel my my subscription you can also pick out the social security number and, and it can start the automation process without the agent actually doing anything but talking to the agent sorry to the customer um, if we take this then a step even further um, so this is actually something that is happening today and uh, uh, we are including also speech recognition in this type of setup uh, later towards uh, uh, later this year and next 
So if we talk about digital co-workers in, uh, as agents, um, the same kind of scenario as, as before, a customer starts talking to some sort of virtual assistant that, that transfers to a human agent. In the future, we, will, we believe that these human agents might as well be uh, digital agents. And these digital agents, obviously they need to understand the uh, speech and, and, and language uh, as, as any virtual assistant would, but they also need to be able to operate in the same environments as the human agents are. Uh, so again, they need to be able to connect to the business applications that human agents are, and in doing so, we can start actually monitoring these digital coworkers as they were agents. We can follow up uh, average handling time. Uh, we can see uh, uh, statistics such as CSAT for a specific interaction. And, and we can start um, using these guys as uh, strengthening our, our service levels, enhancing our service level during peak hours, for instance, or we can bring more of them in during evening hours or weekends, for instance. But in order for this to work, if we want to move the virtual assistants inside the contact center uh, operations, we need them also to, to be able to connect to the same environments that humans would. So with that, uh, that was basically everything from us. Yes, and thank you everyone. And now we open up for any questions. Yes, thank you.